This episode's brought to you by everynowheremusic.com. Yep, you got that right. That's yours truly. So if this is an endeavor you'd like to support, please come and sign up for my newsletter at everynowheremusic.com. Every nowhere or every now here, depending on whichever way you prefer to look at it. All right, folks, please welcome our second returning founding guest on the podcast. Sophie Duner is, as I've mentioned in the last episode, one of the most brilliant, out-of-the-box, badass collaborators I've had the chance to work with in the past, uh, even if for very fleeting collaborations, which I hope will not be the end of the story. We touch upon some extremely important and interesting topics in here. We talk about uh, Sophie's debut as a solo acoustic singer-songwriter at a piano, a set she worked on on the basis of her album, which she arranged and co-produced. We also talk about the very diverse environments she's been a part of, um, both geographically, but also musically. Sophie's one of these musicians who's done it all from working with duos, to quartets, to quintets, to trios, to orchestras. Uh, She's one of my favorite arrangers. She's done it all, so there are very few musicians I know who have that lens complete enough to give these comparative narratives on how each of these situations can be, and at the end of the day, what the most important factors for choosing your collaborators are. As usual, I'd like to remind you that this is an independent show, so if you'd like to support us, you can do so by, one, subscribing to us on a platform of your choice, Apple Podcasts and Spotify are the platforms of the day. And uh, if you feel exceptionally generous, leave us a review. That's the only way we can get the word out. Also, you can tag me on your Instagram posts uh, if you'd like to share them. This is also where I let you know that this show is sponsored by the Holistic Musician Academy.com. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other resources, including other episodes of this podcast and a bunch of artist mind maps, um, practice journals, articles. Uh, we're still in beta, but there's already a whole bunch of resources. I really encourage you to go check out. And now, without much further ado, please welcome Sophie Tuner. Hello fellow beings, welcome to Tapasya Loading, a safe space to attempt honest, raw and authentic conversation in homage to the ancient act of stoking a sacred fire. How is the uh, connection? Pretty good. I hear you pretty well. Um, Yeah, I'm trying out a new system, actually, new season. So I'm trying new stuff out with the podcast. Yeah, it sounds really good quality now. I can hear you very well. Excellent. That being said, I'm I'm actually recording on two different platforms right now. So one's on my Zoom podcast recorder, the other's on on Zoom software, which is like two. They have it's confusing because they have the same name, but it's completely different uh, things altogether. One's a Japanese company who makes uh, hardware and gear for musicians, and the other is the Zoom we are also familiar with. So, uh, anyways, wow. I uh, also, I usually keep video off for a lot of my um, podcasts. Till now, it's been that way. Yeah, I've been told my facial expressions can be very confusing, uh, especially from people who've taken the time to get to know me better, who've told me that, you know, when I first met you, you your facial expressions, they seemed so, it seemed like you were angry at me. Oh, really? or, you know. Yeah, so, and I, and I noticed that a lot of the times, uh, you know, the manner in which my facial expressions are interpreted uh, can cause a certain degree of confusion that a podcast might not be necessarily benefited by. Now, in our case, it's different. We've known each other for a while, so no, that wouldn't be a risk. But that's how I kind of got started into doing audio-only conversations, and I noticed how the quality of the conversation would be so different. Yeah. And I just kind of stuck with the strategy. So so the idea behind recording without audio was, uh, without video always, was that the participants yeah. are immersed in the same experience. List- it's it's just an, you know, another experimental side to the podcast that I try and encourage. I, so uh, I like it both- better. I like it better to communicate with the visuals, actually. 
Um, I know you would. You're an artist. You're a visual artist. Uh, I, I can very well imagine that that plays a big role. So, yeah, let's try it out. So this is officially one of the first episodes where we're going to keep video on, mm -hmm. see what kind of a difference that makes. And uh, all right, let's just take it from there. How have you been, Sophie? You've been mad busy. Uh, yeah, sort of. I have been, uh, you know, I think the fact that the post-COVID years made you mad busy you know you just wanted to speed up and recover everything that you had lost during the the years of the pandemic I think you know don't you feel that that sort of uh, made you go in high speed afterwards yeah it made me go high speed towards nowhere <laughs> in all directions just random in all just directions just do a bunch of stuff with yeah. random do a bunch of stuff none of which you really mm -hmm. necessarily always makes sense it's actually you hit the nail on the head like from the straight off the bat Sophia because I'm here after like being on the road constantly for February I'm like why am I here why have I been constantly traveling for all these months Con completely exhausted and apart from a couple of projects which were really successful ones most of them was just me running around in hoops not really knowing why the, mo the important thing is to keep on producing things i think for me to keep the ball rolling because you make it stop it it's kind of depresses you i feel that i'm i'm mostly happy when i'm very active that is actually a very good point um the The proactive uh, engagement with one's art, I think, is at the end of the day what really is the... Thank you. You, you might have just helped me out with the why, because I was just actually talking to a good friend of mine uh, this morning, well, texting anyway, on how I'm struggling to remember my whys, and you might have just helped me out there. Struggling to remember your whys. Well, I think you seem to have been doing a lot of productive things during the pandemic, didn't you? You did a master and all these amazing projects. I did. I just finished my master's degree. I'm actually uh, in the midst of uh, arguing for a better marking for my last final thesis. But that's a whole different uh, story altogether. Let's talk about you uh, first. You're the guest and you've been up to some really really amazing work of late how has it been to be back on tour again i mean you've been touring in the uk in the u.s um, well it, and it has been uh sort of catching up on things in the u.s it hasn't really been like a a gigging tour uh but it has been uh, okay. in a collaborative tour uh just uh, catching up with uh musicians that i was working with previously uh before mm -hmm. but it was i was I was uh, stuck in the States during lockdown, as you remember, two years ago. Yeah, I do. So this time I've been, um, I was back in March in the States and then I was also back now. Um, and I returned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but I've basically been, you know, catching up on, on um, collaborations and doing work as a composer uh, and recording videos and recording CDs and being, you know, featured guest artists for certain projects. That's what I have been doing. And uh, it's been very, very uh, fulfilling because I was hungry to express myself again after these years of, of only being online. I guess everyone had the necessity to do so. Mm -hmm. But I ended up uh, recording uh, a new CD uh, in London last year. That's true. Well, I'm sorry, excuse me. I recorded a new CD uh, in London this March. Uh, we're not like How, why London how did that happen because during the fall last year I got in touch with an old contact friend of mine Darren Allison who I met actually 20 years ago mm -hmm. who I were supposed to collaborate at the time but it didn't happen and then we ended up connecting again and uh, I needed a sound engineer for a project that I was doing together with a pianist from New York called Eleanor Sandreski and mm -hmm. um, we uh, made a collaboration on the song When the Saints Go Marching In. Um, and this song was for uh, a festival called Add a Movie Film Festival that I was featured in um, last year. And uh, uh, it featured an art film about COVID, um, spirits mm -hmm. 
humans becoming spirits. Hence, I thought the song When the Saints Go Marching In was very suitable for for this film festival and the subject. So um, I had Eleanor make an arrangement of this song and I recorded the vocals in London with Darren. Who's Darren? Darren Allison is a producer. Uh, he uh, is uh, sort of a pop jazz avant-garde uh, producer and he has worked with, uh, he did, I think, six albums, the Divine Comedy, the known English group. Um, he also worked with uh, Eurythmics and Annie Lennox and Amazing. a bunch of people. Uh, he worked with Thora Purim and Ayrton Moreira. You know, he did a lot of variety, variety of interesting projects. Wow, those are some really amazing names. Mm -hmm. Where'd you folks meet? Um, actually, I found him on the internet 20 years ago. Yeah, I was looking no for, I was looking for interesting producers and that was when internet was relatively new. So uh, uh -huh. I think I found him through another artist that I liked and I sort of tracked him down and then I called him up and I said, let's meet. And I was in London and I had tracked down a couple of producers and, and then I ended up meeting him in a coffee place. And yeah, that's how we met. So internet 1.0. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then, so then he sort of popped up again when Facebook started um, and we reconnected. So, uh, well, back to London again in last fall, we did this project together and uh, then we uh, decided to uh, make a solo CD of my music during March this year. So um, that was exciting. We actually did one of the songs I showed him 20 years ago, which I made a video out of, which I made a video out of. And it, it's, it has been uh, highly successful. <laughs> so that was what yeah. happened. Yeah, I think even, I think I saw you liking it yesterday. Oh, I like all of your stuff, though. So you met Darren like 10 years back on Internet 1.0, so to speak, and you folks kept in touch. The first thing I want to uh, really pick your brain on is, you know, that kind of relationship building uh, where you meet someone online and you not just keep it a random correspondence, but you build it to a point where 10 years later you're working on an album together. Yeah. In well, actually, actually, let me correct you. Sorry. I, we actually met 20 years ago. Through the, through, mm. Yeah. So then, then I tracked him down on a meeting in London and we were supposed to do a project, but, you know, I didn't have the funding, whatever. It didn't work out. And then, then maybe 15 years later, we hooked up again via MySpace or Facebook or, you know, and and that's wow. that's how so there was a big gap in in between there. Um, yeah, interesting. So my question would be that kind of relationship building. Do you think it's common these days, or is it something uh, that you you know, you know that was possible because it was a different era back in the day? Um, I think you know it's memory. The reason why well the reason why I hooked up with him again was of course because of the possibilities in on the internet you yeah. know that you can communicate through facebook or you name it um but initially of course it was a it was a the memory of a good meeting i liked his personality and i remembered our meeting so that was of course encouraging you know the fact that i would like to actually work with him what aspects do you think of that first meeting were the ones that came across as the kind of probably, probably the attitude towards music maybe Stylistically, he was probably at the time more into rock and pop and stuff like that. I was more into jazz. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't really matter. It was more the attitude and the feeling about how to do things musically that appealed to me, I guess. Um, and that's memory. That's pure memory. So even though it passes 20 years, you still, mem you still remember the type of connection yeah, I think personality and connection is maybe sometimes more important than if the style is the same. Very much so. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a jazz musician. I'm, you know, I like contemporary music, but I could still work with people who have the right personality, even though they're into pop. It doesn't matter more than maybe if I met a person in jazz that I don't even like, then I don't want to work with him. And I'd prefer to work with someone who does something else. But as long as the energy and the chemistry is there, I think that's far more important. I agree. I'm especially curious in your case because you're such a versatile and broad and deep artistic uh, personality. One of the broadest and deepest I know. You you know you have this amazing 
huge skill set of arranging and songwriting and in a very unorthodox manner and you have the visual artist aspect as well so i'm especially curious like for someone with such a broad perspective like yours what, what take the case of darren for example which I, what exactly about him for example really you know tick the right boxes Probably this kind of raw approach to the arts, or a sensitive and raw approach, and mm. and authentic and honest. Not not so much focused on what's fashionable and what's you know. He just had a pretty authentic uh, and uh, uh, direct approach to to the arts, which I appreciate. Nice, that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not very much into fashion or. What's the latest trend or what's new or modern? I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Same here. I just do what appeals to me. Yeah, sounds about right. So timelessness? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Quality and artistry rather than if it's hip or new or old. Or, uh, I really prefer that more than, you know what's fashionable at the moment. Mm. The album recording this year in London, was that the first time you collaborated or were there collaborations in between as well? Um, well, that was the second time we collaborated as we, he did the sound to the, uh, uh, when the saints go marching. in. Um, so we did that last year, last fall. And then in, in the springtime, we did um, uh, the entire CD, Strictly Business, which is uh, the name of my solo album. Amazing. I want to pick your brain on that a little more in a yeah. bit on the album. But um, I'm still curious, you know, a lot of times you meet someone and you think that you're going to hit it off with them on in the studio or on stage. And then it won't not necessarily be the case. In, and you're confronted with the fact that a lot of times, some, well, sometimes anyway, our personalities aren't as aligned with our artistic personas as many might think. Um, have you ever had those kind of experiences? Oh, sure. Sure. I, I was once uh, at the Medem. Do you know the uh, the uh, big uh, meeting for people in the music industry mm -mm. in the south of France? Mm -mm. Have you heard of it? Medem? No, really, no. The Medem is, is where all the uh, label managers and people from the music industry get together and they right. try to tell things, things to each other. And I, I went there. I probably shouldn't have gone there because it didn't give me anything. It was just horrible. Um, but anyhow, I went there shopping around a CD that I had done at the moment. And uh, you meet a lot of people and you try to get in touch with, with you know, managers and record labels and all kinds of folks from the music industry. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I guess I should have hit it off with the jazz crowd, but I didn't. I ended up speaking to people who were, who were doing pop and country. <laughs> yeah, that makes, that makes sense. I, I'm an avant-garde artist, you know, that doesn't really make sense. But they just, their personalities at that moment appealed to me. But, you know, who knows? Maybe it's just pe two people that you happen to meet that, you know, having said that, sometimes it doesn't matter what style they're doing, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to hit it off. You know, you might hit it off with someone else who does something completely different than you do. Yeah. No, I can absolutely relate. It's ironic. I just got back from Lisbon last night where the Mowomix was happening. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of people would think that, you know, a lot of people even thought that I was there for the Womix. Uh, and I did, in fact, play a gig which was kind of indirectly related to the Womix, but not officially a part of it. But I couldn't be bothered. I didn't go for a single event. I, I, like two days after I was there, I completely forgot that Womix was even happening. And uh, a part of me thinks maybe I'm just too lazy to go there. But it's it's a similar experience I make wherein people would think I would get along with members of the quote-unquote world music community, but I don't. I, I, I mean, the, world, the whole terminology of world music is a bit of a question mark at this point anyway. But even like that entire circle of people... Uh, I don't get along with them, actually. Actually, similar to you, I, I kind of get along with a lot of pop and, um, well, pop musicians, well, um, progressive alternative musicians. Even though my background lies in jazz, too, I tend to get along a lot more with them as well. 
Mm-hmm. But I think it's great that you went ahead and did it. At least you're one ahead of me. I, I never even tried. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was kind of a trip. I went there alone and yeah. I was just running around, you know, trying to uh, to speak to uh, all kinds of uh, music industry people. Mm. It was kind of a mess, actually. I didn't like it. It was very superficial. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, still, it was something to do, I guess, and I will not do it again. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like a, I don't know how to say it, market. Yeah. It's ironic. Uh, just a few weeks before I was in Lisbon, I was also in Mumbai where this huge uh, music expo was happening as well while I was there. And uh, again, I did the same, I had taken the same decision of just not being bothered to go. And uh, it's interesting that like a lot of folks who went again, they're like, wow, yeah, I, I hated the experience. But then again, some some synergy does happen. Some people do get to build networks and so on. But So I guess I, I shouldn't judge, but I don't know about you, but at this point, I feel like like any form of activity that doesn't feel good to me is not something I want to do, even if it's supposed to be beneficial to my career anymore. Does that make sense? Oh, perfectly. It does. It certainly does. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Yeah. Is that is that something that's uh, proved its validity in your musical journey, you think? Oh, sure. Because in the end, no matter how hard you think that it would be a good option, in the end, your feeling will make the final decision if you want to be a part of that or not. So an investment that is thought out, and not felt out will finally fail. That actually is very sensible stuff, what you just said there. If it doesn't feel good, even if it's logical, it'll it just, yeah. It's not music well, then, is it? It will not end up in a logical result if it doesn't feel good. So the, yeah. you know, thinking yourself to the right thing might not always give a logical result. Oh, that you're, is so you're good. Interested, you're interested in the result, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The result. That makes so much sense, Sophie. I guess that's where the biggest difference between a businessman and an artist eventually is. Because as artists, we are entrepreneurs at one level. But I think the marked difference between the two roles is at that point. For a businessman, even if it didn't feel good, if there's a profit, it will be written off as a success. I think as an artist... Mm -hmm. Despite profit, it still won't really be written off as a success if it didn't feel good. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I keep rambling. Yeah. Here. Sorry, I'm doing a terrible job of being a podcaster today. <laughs> By the way, welcome back. You're you're the second returning artist on the podcast, and. Um, well, I'm happy to be here. The last time we did this was, I think, two years ago. Yeah, I'm very happy to have you back, Sophie. It's an absolute honor. Yeah, that, was, that was after COVID, I think. It was during COVID. Oh, it was, oh sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was during COVID, and this was, is after COVID. Yes, so. it was during COVID. It was right after the whole Black Lives Matter went uh, all uh, big time. Uh, during the time you were in the, in the U.S., actually, in the thick of it all. And so, yeah, it was bang in the middle of the pandemic, actually. Mm-hmm. So, circling back, tell us more about your album recorded in London. Yes. So, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, in the States, I made a couple of exciting videos together with a collaborator I have in Wisconsin called Eric Segnitz. Amazing. And uh, we did some amazing videos uh, at uh, David Vertanian's studio, DV Productions. Uh, and I'm very, very happy about these artistic uh, videos that we managed to make together. It's uh, it was a real um, thrill to um, to make them. Um, I was uh, um, also passing time in New York City, where I was uh, collaborating with uh, some other collaborators of mine, uh, such as Jean Pritzker and the composers. Concordance. Amazing. And I will be featured as a as composer for one of their upcoming big band events Beautiful. at the, the Players Theatre in Greenwich Village on December 6th. Um, so looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to have my, 
my piece Let's Go Commercial that is from the CD. It will be uh, arranged by Jean for um, an upcoming big band uh, event by Composers Concordance Big Band. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be on December 6th, um, like I said. Um, so, uh, yes, my time in the States. I was also recording a new Mingus CD together with percussionist Bertram Lehmann, who's Berkeley faculty and longtime friend of mine. We studied together at Berkeley, and he was in my band once many, many years ago when I, when I attended Berkeley. And uh, he, uh, 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 he and I had a gig a couple of years ago in Cambridge, and um, we uh, did a version of a Weird Nightmare, the, the Mingus tune. And uh, after the gig, he made a remix of this piece that I really liked. He made a remix with electronics. And I said, we have to make a, a CD in this style, you know, just mm. percussion, electronics and voice. And as I was uh, going to the States um, to visit Eric, my, my the, the violinist I spoke to you about, um, who collaborated on the videos, I, I said, well, you know, Bertram, we can make this CD together finally out of Mingus tunes and duo percussion and electronics. Nice. Um, so um, we ended up doing that in his studio and uh, I'm waiting for the result to be ready probably in the wintertime. Amazing. I notice you keep referring to the albums as CDs. Um and do you actually sell CDs or is it just a terminology you're stuck with? Oh, sure. I sell CDs. I sell this new one. I have physical CDs. Um, the, the new CD I made, Strictly Business, I, I sell physical CDs and also digital CDs. I'm on CD Baby and they distribute on the internet. Sure. Interesting because um, uh, um, a lot of people, you're one of the very few artists I know who actually still, you know, goes to the trouble of actually printing her music onto CD and selling him. Um, what's been your yeah. inspiration? Yeah, I know, I know, I know it's, I know it's old fashioned, but I think if you have concerts, people want something physical. They don't want something digital. No, I would like to think exactly. I mean, I, I actually miss CDs. I also miss selling them. So, what? Um, that, that would have been my question. So, do, are these CDs are, are they a good investment for you? Uh, I don't know yet, but you know, it's good to hand out to people. It's good to sell after mm. concerts. So it's uh, like March. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had, a. uh, yeah, I think it's nice, nice to have something physical to yeah, give. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, so far I've had digital concerts for the CD. Uh, I had a CD release concert on the Dr. Sushi free jazz barbecue, uh, in New Where's York. that? That's in Milwaukee. That's where I spent a couple of weeks now making videos. Um, nice. So uh, Milwaukee um, has a station called WMSE. And I am, well, I have been featured during the last two years. Uh, post my present music uh, residency, composer residency, I was a Composer in residency with the new music group Present Music in Milwaukee two years ago, when, when the pan, pre pandemic. And that's when I got in touch with Dr. Sushi's free jazz bar barbecue. And Dr. Sushi has been uh, um, playing my music during two years, uh, very generous. So he invited me to co host his radio show uh, where we uh, spoke of my CD and uh, played my new CD, Strictly Business, as well as. Uh, playing music that has influenced me during the years. So I, I was actually in the studio with Dr. Sushi running his show, which was very exciting. Tell us about Dr. Sushi. Who's Dr. Sushi? <laughs> he's a, he's a, a DJ. Oh, right. Is he, is he like well known? A jazz DJ. Please forgive my ignorance. I said, I haven't actually been familiar with his work. Dr. Sushi is a jazz DJ um, nice. who runs a, who runs a radio show in the States. You've been doing a lot of those, huh? Radio shows. Yeah, so we we run his show together a couple of weeks ago. Amazing. I'm trying to f figure out the symmetry between the sessions you did in London and the so are these uh, and the sessions you did in U the US. So are these two different albums you were working on at the same time, or are they connected? Or 
No, no. The album I did uh, in London is my own solo CD of my own tunes. Okay. Um, where, right. where I play the piano. Yeah. And the CD I did with uh, Bertram on electronics and percussion was in Boston. Okay. Let's talk about your soul. Yeah. Let's talk about the first one. Hang on. You, you, you're playing, you're playing piano and singing. Yeah. That's my, my solo CD from wow. March in London. That is amazing. And, let's dig yeah. into that. Yeah, Cause I remember yeah. you, um, us having very brief conversations about, you know, uh, pl- singing while playing piano. So is this the first album you've recorded where you're playing piano yourself? Yes. Wow, congratulations to start off with, yeah. my respect. And uh, how, what was it like? But what was the experience like? Playing the piano. Yeah, the whole experience. Not just playing piano, but also, you know, the, the whole writing, recording and performing experience of the whole, you know, solo singer, songwriter, piano thing. Uh, yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, it's different, especially I like to do a lot of rubato when I sing. Mm. So I'm I'm sort of the boss about when to speed up and when to slow down, which is kind of unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think nobody knows that better than than yourself, right? So yep. it has its advantages. I mean, I I do like to play in in trios and quartets, of course. But still, you know, using the piano, I can bam as hard as I want. I can do uh, all these crazy things, uh, which sort of makes it a uh, a bit of a freak show if I would do it live, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, no, don't take me wrong. I mean, in a good way, no, you know, no. I can really, I like to be very loud. I like to play very loud and I like to be very soft You know, I'm, I'm extremely dynamic, even on the piano. I know. So, uh, sure. And you know, that's a certain kind of taste, you know, in, in today's world of where things tend to, you know, not be quite like that. Um, I, um, I enjoyed it. I mean, most of the time I was, was, we were recording directly with the piano and the voice at the same time. In some of the songs, we did the piano separately and I was singing on top of that. Right. Did you work out the piano arrangements yourself? Was it a lot of work? Did it seem easier or more difficult than you thought it would be? Some songs are easier than others. I, re- I really realized actually some of the, there's one song that I did a video with called The Multiple Useful. And that's more of a sort of a, Steely Danish kind of a pop jazz tune. And that turned out really easy because you just play what's written, you know. Uh, but I think the jazz tunes are more of a more of a challenge for me as a jazz singer, oddly enough. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm a little yeah. curious yeah. when you say with, my, with the tunes where you said you just play what's written. So you wrote out the piano arrangements first and then played them? Yeah, I mean, the the pop songs are very written out. Yeah. And you write them out? Yeah. Okay, so so I'm trying to visualize the whole process you went through here. You sat yourself down, you wrote the song, and then you wrote out the piano arrangements first and then learned your own piano parts. Yeah, but I've been doing that for years. Yeah? It's not new songs. They're, they're uh, pretty, uh, I mean, some of the songs are 15 years old, so... Interesting. That that actually is, um, um, if I may share a little, I actually worked on a um, similar portfolio. I haven't released it yet. I'm working on it, where I kind of reinterpreted a lot of songs, some of which are also 15 or even 20 years old. Uh, and I kind of rewrote arrangements for a solo singer songwriter at the piano kind of thing Sim- exactly the same setup really mm. and uh, it was interesting how the same songs kind of became different songs right yeah wow this has been quite quite the interesting i'm so sorry about these audio issues you know it's funny th- uh this hasn't happened ever this is the first time this has actually happened maybe it's an internet thing maybe because i pressed I press the internet now again, and then it became better. Maybe it's like a bad connection. Yeah, I'm guessing that might have been what it was. Maybe if, if it's been raining here and bad weather, and sometimes the connection maybe failed due to it's ah, right across the ocean. Right. It's right next to yeah. Oh, wow, you live right next to the ocean. That's amazing. For where, where, where are you at right now, anyway? This is uh, outside Gothenburg in Sweden. 
That's amazing. Uh, how cold is it? Not too bad, actually. It was it was windy and rainy today. I have no idea how cold it is, but it always seems colder here because it's humid. I hadn't realized that was a thing. That's interesting yeah. information. Anyway, where were we? <laughs> we were talking yeah, about... We were- we were speaking about the uh, how it was to make a solo CD, uh, accompanying yourself on the piano. Right. So, so uh, yeah, the, the, take me through again. How did it feel? Was it? Did it feel intimidating in any way? Being all on your own, singing all these songs. No, actually, I, as a singer, I kind of like to have a. It feels like I'm having a weapon. Mm, interesting. Playing the piano. Yeah, it actually, from a performance point of view, you can be very loose because you're having like an arm in a weird way. I enjoyed that. Um, Wow, that's really interesting. I really like that. I really, it makes me relax. Huh. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like I have, it feels like I have a, in a weird way, it feels like I have a supporter from the piano. Hmm. So you're not at the mercy of some insensitive, um, <laughs> insensitive, uh, overtly uh, egoistic uh, instrumentalist who doesn't necessarily understand your music. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> you're putting words in my mouth. <laughs> I know, and I, I, I say this in well, co- I say this in I mean, context I, I, yeah. to your yeah, last I conversation. Think, uh, I, I, I do think that maybe this is, has partly been maybe a reaction to that, possibly to be able to be independent, which is very good. You know, you can just move anywhere and you can make a, a concert without going through the hustle of calling people or having a band with three people, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I must say that I love singing with a jazz tree and a jazz quartet or a big band, you know, because it's the ping pong thing in jazz that it triggers you. It inspires you. I did another recording when I was in Milwaukee of, with a jazz trio of an, another s- new song of mine called the rabbits on wall street, mm-hmm. which was a sort of a collaboration with, with the person who wrote a poem to be, uh, this is a two separate, separate projects, but anyhow, um, I did record that new song of mine and uh, it was done with, with the jazz trio and uh, uh, it's been a while since I did a recording with the jazz trio and it really, really, really brought me back to, you know, the fact that I love singing jazz like that. Um, it's just sometimes hard to keep a band consistent, you know, yeah. especially if you, you want to travel and you want to do gigs in different places. It's expensive to travel with the same band. So I have for a long time, yeah. uh, before I started to do all these uh, uh, chamber music projects with strings and stuff, you know, before that I, I did collaborate with a lot of different jazz musicians for a long time in different places with different setups, with little time to rehearse, bringing up, bringing my own tunes you know, and that can be pretty, it's pretty hard because usually there's not a lot of time to rehearse and yeah. you bring stuff that you want to do. And it, it's, 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 it's it's like a barbecue, you know, it's a, yeah. it's very difficult, you know, you want to usually play it safe if you meet new people and you ha- if you have little time, you know, yeah. uh, it's hard to make, keep a group consistent, you know that. So, so, you know, for me, I thought it was a good alternative to also have a solo act. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean I only want to do that, you know, um, because, of course, you don't have the correspondence with a bass player. You don't have the correspondence with a drummer or with a, with a pianist, which is lovely when it turns out well. There's yeah, nothing better. Yeah, you know? sure. But it's, uh, it's you know, still there the different humans everywhere. And it's, it's, it's apart from the musician, you have to get along with a person. And there's a lot of stuff involved that makes it sometimes complicated. Mm-hmm. So true. And there's, there's two specific brands of independence we're talking about here. One is the independence to engage with fellow musicians in a spontaneous and appropriate manner. The other is being your own act without being without having to rely on anyone for your act to be completely self-sufficient and ready to go anytime. How, what would you say were your best tools to work on these two separate brands of independence? My best tools... Um how do you get there? I mean, for, for, for a lot of younger artists, they would love to be in that position and would love to have those skills that you have. So how did you work on them? I think if, no, if, 
when you know when you work with a group it's always good to have everything really 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 down so you don't have to go through uh situations where especially if you're a singer you know because they're always going to barbecue you about the charts you know <laughs> this time they didn't yeah. it was all there it was perfect I, i knew exactly what i wanted you know and sometimes maybe you know uh I've been in, in situations where maybe the charts weren't perfect, uh, but I still know the sound that I want. So I guess mm -hmm. then it's up to the musician to just listen out, hear out, hear me out what it is that I want. But mm -hmm. sometimes they don't do that. They just want to have the perfect language to communicate the song. And if you don't have that, they have no time to listen to you and they're going to they're gonna play what the chart says, even if it's fucked up, you know, they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, sitting around during the mastering process and, well, the mixing process, not the mastering process, but the mixing pro process at least. Oh, you do um, that too? You're part of the mixing and mastering process as well? Not the, not the mastering, I wasn't, but the mixing, yes, the entire mixing. And that took a long time. How many days? I have probably a week. Wow. Yeah, it took really long, um, being very careful. Um, and I think that's good. I agree. I like that. Yeah, I agree. Because it, it's it's really a continuation of of the artist. Indeed. And that's hard to deal with the human beings, ex the expression of the human being. I mean, that shouldn't be quick. Mm -hmm. That's like spitting on what you did. If someone does it quick, you know, it's like, that's like canceling you, putting a big compressor, you know. Yeah. Who wants to... Who wants to cancel sound? That's a cheap way out. Very true. How many takes did you do per song? I don't know. Okay, maybe it could be three, could be two, could be one, could be four. And how do you make the? How do you choose the one you think makes it to the album? I was always the opin of the opinion that the first one is the best from an artistic point of view. Mm -hmm. And maybe from a technical point of view, one of the later ones. And then, but usually probably something in between both, you know, when you like very first one or very, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, as long as it's spontaneous, you know, because when you start to think too much and you start to try better and harder and yeah. hipper, then, then you're just out. Yeah. I hear you. Then you lost it when you get too conscious. Absolutely. Um, it's hard to kind of forget your brains, right? Absolutely, totally um, with you there. And the, the uh, right attitude, the artistic attitude is usually there in the first take, I think. Yeah, that's such a mind fuck, overthinking the entire process. Or, 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 in the, or the very last take, you know, oh, could also yeah. be, or the, I don't know. Those, yeah, those can be really interesting too. Well, you start to, yeah, you start to try, you try too hard after the first take. You try hard to sound better, you know, and then a couple of takes after the first take, and then maybe the best take is sort of after that. Yeah, there is a certain potential of surrender during by the time you've hit the last version. At that point, at least in my case, I don't want to speak for you or anyone else, of course. It's like, oh, whatever, we've done three takes at this point. I've got nothing to lose, so I'll just do another one and not give a shit about how it really sounds like. So this is... So, Again, I repeat myself. That's not be the shit. That's yeah, it. yeah, that's It's like surrender. saying with uh, yeah. I did a, I did a, a photography session a couple of weeks ago, and it all started to happen when I just started to run around. Hmm. And he, well, actually, I usually do it that way. I just run around. Interesting. Like literally run around. Uh, yeah, and I get caught on the camera, so. That way you're not going to do and stand and pose and do some rigid face that just comes out the wrong way. When you nice. run, you move all the time. You're in constant motion. Then you, the camera, will, if you click on the camera all the time, then, then something's going to land on the camera, right? Yeah. But that was the best shot. It was the most natural shot and the most attractive shot because I didn't, I didn't, you know, pose and like smile and do silly faces. I just landed on the camera and it was all very spontaneous. I think mm -hmm. the same thing with music. It's like movement, timing, movement. So true. And unpretentious timing and movement. It just get a play and flow. 
naturally. Gold nuggets here. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like exactly the kind of deep insight someone like you would come up with, you know, that link between the visual and oral world. It makes sense. <laughs> it, it's true. It's the same with the same with the painting, I guess. Uh it's sort of it's gonna be well, at least the first idea is gonna be gotta be spontaneous. Then you can work on it. But the first idea has got to land on the paper in a very spontaneous, unconscious way for me, in order for them to be exciting and have any exciting energy. Yeah. After that, you can keep on working, you can keep on developing, developing it and working on it, but it's got to be like subconsciously loose. Yeah. Brain, brainless. Very true. I know, I know exactly what you mean. It's, um, yeah, the, the, the flow state a lot of people refer it to. Yeah, yeah, the flow state, exactly, the flow state. It's interesting, a lot of your paintings look like someone in states of motion as well. Some of the paintings? Yeah, a lot of your paintings, mm. they're very dynamic, they, you know, it, it's, they, they, don't look, they don't look like someone necessarily standing still or sitting still, or even if they are, they, you know, there's a lot of motion that comes across through the painting, or correct me if I'm wrong, you, you reckon that's... An inherent yes oh I, 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 yeah um maybe i guess i i like to paint action something that's happening mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i do um yeah so the key word here i guess is dynamic because you refer to how you talk about how dynamic your music is too when you sing so i'm guessing that's something really important to you like being dynamic. Well, timing, 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 timing is an important word too. Timing. Can you tell me more about that? What exactly are you referring to when you say timing? I'm interested in that. Well, just the way you sing a song, when you enter and when you don't sing. Mm. How, you, how you construct a composition in the same way. You want it to be, uh, you want it uh, to be surprising, right? The mm -hmm. entrances, the entrances, be it uh, performing, uh, or be it writing a composition, you want surprise, like it is when you have a conversation with someone, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want you you don't want it to be well, how like mono, monotone? How do you say that when it's uh, monologous? You, you, uh, again, I always say you don't speak in four four, do you? <laughs> That's a good one. We speak in all kinds of time fields. I'm starting to like quote myself now because I always bring up this subject. But those are great quotes, though. No, we don't speak in four four. So why should we write music in four four? Or why should we sing in four four? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I didn't speak in four four right now, did I? No, you didn't. Why don't you transcribe my me talking? You will end up with all kinds of time fields. So then, why should we compose music? That is not like that. That is so true. You know, you, you keep on doing timing. Also, uh, how you feel and what kind of conversation, if you're angry, if you're sad, the time feels are going to be even more bumpy, you know. Wow, I never thought about that. That is so true. You know, you see these internet memes of drummers and uh, some, some keyboard players like literally transcribing and playing a conversation uh, on their instrument. You know, it, it totally makes sense now, especially after you just uh, said what you said. I mean, the minute you said, I don't speak in 4-4, four, four, do I? I actually started listening to your words as a melody. And I could hear a melody to it immediately. That was so interesting. When did you start thinking about this? I'm curious. A couple of years ago, mm -hmm. when I was a part of a series called the Donne, Women in Music, created by... Uh, Oh. A woman in London called Gabriella Di Lacho. She's a, a opera singer who started a project called Donne about uh, female composers. So uh, she in, she made me do a video with with uh, interview question, and I was a part of this series. She won uh, one of the most interesting uh, people BBC Hundred something a couple really? of years ago. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, one of the questions was about how I compose. And uh, mm. I guess I had already thought about this. 
So that was one of the questions I was talking about. Amazing. Mm. Yeah, because it's anti-natural being in 4-4 and it's anti-natural being consistent too. I mean, I someone said, was a writer, made a, a quote the other day I read, that the only consistent people are dead. <sighs> I mean, who else is consistent? You know, you're going to play the same style your entire life. You're going to look like ketchup your entire life. I mean, that's not normal. It's normal to change. So oh, why okay. don't you change with a musical style? You change as a person. Then why do you have to stay the same in the arts? I mean, that's sick, you know. <laughs> then I there's something. That. You can't be ketchup. I'm going to have to remember that one. You can't be ketchup. That nails it. Like There's something wrong with it. So when you go into the studio now, when you went in the studio to record your album, were these thoughts you consciously kept in your mind? No. <laughs> these thoughts follow? No, I no, I've been already fed with that information. Yeah. But when I when like I say when I when I uh when I uh exhale the information, when I perform, when I compose when I write when I paint I don't use my head but this information stuff like that that I have read and when you take in information it it, it, it becomes like in a library right and then you spit it out and then you don't have to use that because it's already programmed like a computer so so you don't have to think when you 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 execute the arts exactly. people say yeah that's being primitive that's being you know you need brains you need you need to be a Yeah, but you're already, you can't confuse the subject matter with the way you do things. So true. That doesn't, being emotional, being brainless when you're, you're executing the, the, the art is, doesn't mean you're brainless. It just means that it was stored at an earlier stage. Exactly. <laughs> I, th I, th I think plans are a great fundament for intuition to do its dance of freedom on. Yeah. I think it's a great means to an end, but not the end. No. And I see this amongst a lot of colleagues, some of my friends, uh, where, you know, they so, they're so caught up in their plans that they eventually end up getting on this hamster wheel of just executing plans without necessarily stopping to think for a minute where, you know, why the plans were put into place to start off with, you know. I have the other, and we've talked about this too in the past, there is the other other poll where people just jump in with you know no idea what they're doing and kind of just expect it to take the word they want to but that doesn't apply to someone like you for example who's already put in the work but, but i don't see that that could be you can still jump in without thinking but you can still be fed with a lot of information before that so it doesn't interfere with with the act of jumping in loosely Or, or that's just uh, the act of doing it. That's just how you do it. But the how, the how has nothing to do with what's in there. I completely so, agree with you. I, I guess what I'm getting at I is... I don't see the problem with that. Yeah, yeah. No, I guess what I'm getting at is have we learned to swim before we dive in? Because, you know, diving okay, in sure. diving yeah. in is a yeah. great thing. Yeah. But not, not if, you don't, if you haven't put in the work to learn no, how no, to swim. No, 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 no. Yeah. But well, you got to have you yeah. made your homework before you drive bingo, in, Bingo, right? bingo. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. We've been rambling for a while now, and um, um, I apologize again for all the technical issues today. I mean, really, I uh, thank you so much for hanging in there, by the way. You're extremely gracious, and please forgive my moronry. Um, so uh, tell me tell me about, have I missed out on any uh, specifics you'd like to talk about, though, before we kind of taper off? Is there anything specific you'd like to talk about? Uh Let me think. I've been speaking about my latest project, the uh, Strictly Business CD, and I've been speaking about the upcoming CD, Mingo CD with Bertram Lehmann. I've been speaking, uh, it's called Entitled Modern Mingus. Uh, I've been speaking about my collaboration with my partner, Eric Zegnitz. Yeah. And I've been, just important, important, just important projects that I've been doing this last uh, months and that I'm grateful for. Yeah, we'll include links to all your all the work you've been putting in, uh, all the projects you're working on currently. But, you know, here's something that would be really interesting for me to know, because you're, you're, 
working in so many different environments uh, in the US itself you know you're in New York and then you're out in the Midwest and then you work in different parts of the US there's Europe but you've been to the best of my knowledge working primarily in the US in the in the past year and uh, then there's also the recording sessions you did in London how do you think these environments influenced did you do you feel the the influence of these environments on your work did you feel your work changing I don't know. I think I've been focusing more, starting to try to focus more on my own stuff than the environments. Because when I focus mm-hmm. too much on the environment, I get lost. Interesting. Because the environments have nothing to do with me. Yeah. I Actually, I did forget to say that during COVID, no, not during COVID, when was it? Well, it was last year in February, I was uh, uh, doing two concerts in Brighton to mm. audiovisual concert wow. at uh, the feminist bookshop in Brighton. I remember. And I also did a concert at, at a, a little mini castle called Danny House where I uh, did a presentation of uh, my, um, it was, this was like a pre-CD presentation with audiovisual uh, work on the walls. Um, and this was called Strictly Business. So I did all these songs there. And that was exciting. And I also did a tour with uh, the new music composer, Jacob TD. I forgot to mention that. That was last year in, it was about a year ago. So I was hired as a, a singer with his premiering uh, the Freedom Songs. And, but that was new music. That was not jazz. So um, I've been doing that. So I've been, yes, I've been quite busy um, in spite of the uh, the covid pandemic years and I've been participating in the Charles Mingus Jazz Festival twice. Mm -hmm. I was invited and featured in the Charles Mingus Jazz Festival and I was also featured twice in the Adam Movie Film Festival in Harlem. But this was during COVID pandemic years. Nice. So Uh, yeah I remember those. Um it's um sorry I interrupted you keep going. Sorry? No, I said, uh, sorry, I think I might have interrupted you. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah, I didn't hear you. <laughs> you, you were saying something. <laughs> Do you hear me now? Oh, no. No, I didn't. Uh, that's all. I ended with uh, the film festivals I was doing. And I think I covered, I think I covered everything I'm doing. <laughs> By the way, uh, I don't know if you know this, but... Um, it, you know, for my listeners who don't know about this, you were also one of my collaborators from our performance portfolio for my master's degree. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and I don't know if you if you know this, but my professor loved what you did, especially that track. You were a featured soloist on. That was uh, he really loved what you did, and uh, we talked about this later on. That there are very few people in the world who are capable of doing what you did on that track. Exciting. That level. Yeah. Yeah. Mad gratitude again. I really do love improvising on top of that. I did some of that in when I was in New York. I was sitting in with uh, Gene, and there was this guy there called uh, Kmetatron Banks, who's like mm-hmm. a rapper, and we were doing improv together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I'll send you a link of that. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. I, I remember being blown by what he did. It's also interesting on this recording because, you know, we, there were three featured solo, soloists who were asked to be featured. And no one got back to me on time with regards to when yeah. they can send in their track in. And then eventually all three of them recorded their yeah. track coincidentally on the same day oh. and sent it to me. And it's like the yeah. three of you are communicating yeah. in real time or something. It's crazy. Like Johannes, the trumpet player, he's at some point, he's literally playing similar phrases to what you're singing. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really quite spooky. How oh, yeah. they, like uh, later on, like Johannes the, told me later on that it's, uh, there's some, mm-hmm. some, some intense interstellar communication happening here. Uh, which is really what it sounded like. It really sounded like the three of you were in the same room playing live with each other. It's pretty spooky, yeah. actually. There was yeah. some connection there. Wow. Sophie, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor again uh, to have you on, as usual. And for my, for my listeners, uh, definitely please go check out all the links mentioned and we're going to make sure all of them are included. Thanks. Thank you again so much for coming on. And 
please accept my most sincere apologies for the technical issues we ran into today. Still think we have a lot of a lot of useful information in there which I'd love to share with my listeners. So we're good. Yes. Gratitude from the bottom of my heart for listening to the very end. Please consider taking a minute to subscribe to our show so you know when the next episode is out. This is a labor of love, one I hope snowballs into one that's sustainable in its attempt to support independent thought and authentic relating. And having you as a regular member of our audience is what makes that a realistic prospect. Much love, talk soon. Just another voice that is.